This is This Week in Amateur Radio. For the past 23 years, your weekly amateur radio and technology news and on-the-air bulletin service. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1202 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The February Volunteer Monitor Program Report has been released. We will tell you all the details. A new FCC study will determine if receivers play a role in rejecting radio frequency interference. Internet outages are affecting amateurs in West Bengal. We'll have all the details. Axiom's first private mission to the International Space Station will carry several amateurs. We will introduce you to them. The rapid development of low Earth orbit satellite constellations now has some researchers worried about the Kessler effect. The ARRL Teachers Institute will offer four sessions this summer. The annual Armed Forces Day crossband exercise is set for mid-May. And there's a whole lot more, and it's all straight ahead in this week's edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will answer the questions, how reliable are solid-state drives? And... What is wear leveling? Leo will also cover the multiple ways you can back up windows. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Australia's own Anil Benshop, VK6FLAB, will be with us, and he is very excited in his shack this week because his latest project beeps. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill looks back at the state of amateur radio in the fabulous 50s. He will explain what WERS, the War Emergency Radio Service, was, and will take you back to the beginning of RACES, the Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service, now under the jurisdiction of the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, presents part two of his six-part series explaining how to get your club meeting or ham fest promoted on local broadcast radio by correctly composing and submitting a public service announcement. We'll have the latest from Parks on the Air. All that and a whole lot more is straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from beautiful downtown Albany, New York, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from the sleepy little town of Cortlandville, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our amateur radio station high atop New York's western Catskills, where we're waiting for 12 inches of snow ah, on top of the mud. I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred, November Fox 2 Fox. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where we have just a couple more blasts of winter to contend with, I'm Eric, KD2, RJX. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, where I'm wondering if someone up north is missing some snow. If you are, I think I found some of it. You're welcome to it, but down south here it melts fast. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off our news this week is the monthly Volunteer Monitor Program Report. The Volunteer Monitor Program is a joint initiative between ARRL and the Federal Communications Commission to enhance compliance in the amateur radio service. This is the February 2022 activity report of the Volunteer Monitor Program. Technician class operators in North Attleboro, Massachusetts, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and Broken Arrow, Oklahoma were issued advisory notices for FT8 operation on 20 meters. Technician licensees have no privileges on 20 meters. Technician class operators in Auburn, Indiana, Crosby, Texas, Pierre, South Dakota, Chicago, Illinois, and Mojave, California were issued advisory notices for FT8 operation on 7.074 MHz. Technicians have only CW privileges on 40 meters. 
General class operators in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Phoenix, Arizona, and Hefzibah, Georgia, were issued advisory notices for operation on 20-meter frequencies not authorized to general class operators. The Volunteer Monitor Program Administrator had two meetings with the FCC and participated in two amateur radio club meetings via video conference. The final totals for Volunteer Monitor Program monitoring during January 2022 were 2,172 hours on HF frequencies and 2,932 hours on VHF frequencies and above, for a total of 5,104 hours. We thank Volunteer Monitor Administrator Riley Hollingsworth, K4ZDH, for this month's report. Yahoo! UK News reports that Russian troops currently invading Ukraine usually use ERA cryptophones, which require a functioning 3G or 4G network to be in place. But by destroying many of the mobile phone masts around them, they've rather shot themselves in the foot and have been forced to switch to insecure communications. The report cites the investigative work of Bellingcat, an open-source investigative journalism organization which specializes in uncovering information on events such as the Salisbury poisonings and the situation in Syria by analyzing large data sets. According to Bellingcat's executive director, Christo Groziev, the Russian military tried unsuccessfully to use their era cryptophones in Kharkiv after destroying many mobile phone cell towers and also replacing others with their own stingrays. Stingrays are eavesdropping devices that are used to replace and pretend to be normal cell towers so that nearby mobiles connect to this Russian listening device instead and can thus be intercepted without the user realizing. Realizing. But without 3G or 4G for their own secure era encrypted phones, the Russian army in Ukraine has been obliged to put local analog SIM cards into their mobiles to communicate, which are very easy to intercept. And that's just what has been happening, allowing Ukraine intelligence to eavesdrop on Russian army conversations. You can read the full Yahoo story at uk.news.yahoo.com. The Federal Communications Commission is issuing a new study about the ongoing issue of radio frequency interference that seems to plague all radio amateurs and shortwave listeners. FCC Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel has pledged that the agency will take a closer look at the role receivers play in rejecting the increasing levels of RF interference. Speaking at the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, Spain, on March 1st, Chairwoman Rosenworcel said that until now, most discussions of RFI have focused predominantly on transmitters with rules put in place regarding transmitter performance to remove RFI. She said this approach was being rethought at the FCC, adding wireless communications only exists when transmitters are connected to receivers. Both are vital both matter. And going forward, policymakers need to consider both transmitting and receiving, not just the former to the expense of the latter. She said she expected to move forward on an inquiry into receiver performance next month. The goal is to explore regulations, guidelines, and incentives for better performance on specific frequencies or across all bands. She said she is seeking a more transparent and predictable radio frequency environment for all spectrum users, new and old. In what may be a first, the Northeast Ham Exposition will host both the ARRL New England and Hudson Division conventions this year. With more on what promises to be an exciting new Ham Exposition, we go to Ellsworth, Maine, where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this report. Ham Exposition takes place August 26th through the 28th in Marlboro, Massachusetts, and tickets will become available on May 1st. Formerly known as Boxboro, and still called that by a lot of people in New England, the New England Division Convention features a Saturday morning keynote address, Friday and Saturday evening banquets with guest speakers, a large outdoor flea market, and ample indoor vendor space. Proceeds from the convention will benefit scholarships for both New England and Hudson Division students. Volunteers and speakers will be drawn from both divisions 
Other details will be worked out as things progress. ARRL Hudson Division Director Rhea Jairam, N2RJ, said that by joining forces with the New England Division for a joint convention, we can, quote, bring back a sense of nostalgia and community. New New England Division Director Fred Kemmerer, AB1OC, called it a great opportunity to expand ham exposition participation and programs and to support scholarships for young hams in both divisions. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. ARRL First Vice President Mike Raisbeck, K1TWF, predicted larger attendance than has been seen in many years. In February, FEMARA, the organization that runs Ham Exposition, voted to officially approve the unique arrangement. The combined events have received ARRL Division Convention sanctioning, approved by Directors Kemmerer and Jerome. Both are members of the Ham Exposition Convention Committee, along with New England Division Vice Director Phil Temples, K9HI, who serves as the program chair. Vice President Raisbeck is the FEMARA President and the Convention's Vice Chair. Raisbeck said Ham Exposition will return to the venue selected for last year's event, the Best Western Royal Plaza Hotel and Trade Center in Marlboro. The new facility is everything we had hoped for. It is newer and larger than our old venue and is more centrally located with restaurants, shops, and other hotels only minutes away, he said. We have long-term commitments from the hotel, and we plan to be at this location for the foreseeable future. Visit the convention website for more information, such as how to volunteer, serve as a speaker, and take advantage of the convention discount when booking hotel reservations. According to India Television News, hams throughout the West Bengal state in India are experiencing limited access to Echolink and other internet-assisted amateur radio services through March 16. The hams are among hundreds of others affected after the state government announced restrictions to contain what they called illegal activities on the Internet. News reports gave no specific details beyond the announcement itself. The report on the India TV News website quoted an official in the Home and Hill Affairs Department in announcing that the government has received intelligence reports that unlawful activities were carried on in certain areas over Internet transmissions and voice over Internet telephony hence the restrictions that are being imposed on the use of the Internet. Ambarish Nag Bijwa, VU2JFA, secretary of the West Bengal Radio Club, said that the daytime use of the Internet is off-limits, but there's still access in the evenings. He said everyone in the West Bengal state has been affected. Amateur radio on the International Space Station has announced that two crew members scheduled to fly on Axiom Mission 1, AX-1, the first private astronaut mission to the International Space Station will carry out amateur radio contacts with six schools while in space. With more details on this first private mission to the space station, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from Ellsworth, Maine. The AX-1 mission is currently set to launch from Florida on March 30th via a SpaceX Falcon 9 launcher and the crew will spend 10 days in orbit aboard the ISS. AX-1 crew members Mark Pathy, KO4WFH from Canada, and Aiton Stibby, 4Z9SPC from Israel, will carry out the contacts. ARIS has trained both crew members in the use of the ARIS radio system and the ISS Columbus module. Stibby will use ARIS facilities on board the ISS to answer questions from students in Israel Israel Pathy will connect with elementary and high schoolers across Canada. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. As part of the Rakia mission, Stibby will use ARIS facilities on board the ISS to answer questions from middle school and high school students in Israel. Forty classes are expected to participate, and in the weeks preceding the launch, the students will learn a bit about the theory and practice of radio communication. Pathy, whose personal mission theme is caring for people and the planet, will connect with elementary and high schoolers across Canada from the ISS. Pathy will answer student-developed questions that range from how his body has reacted to being in space to handling everyday tasks in zero gravity, as well as thoughtful questions around the state of our planet. The long-held dream of private missions to stations in space 
becomes a reality on AX1, said Frank Bauer, KA3HDO, Executive Director of Aris USA and Chair of Aris International. Aris is proud to collaborate with Axiom Space Mark Pathy and ITAN Stibby on this flight and support the AX1 crew members through amateur radio contacts that will inspire, engage, and educate school students in science, technology, engineering, arts, and math topics. Mary Lynn Dittmar, Executive Vice President of Government Operations and Strategic Communications for Axiom Space, said, Axiom is proud to help enable the educational work of Aris USA on this historic mission. For years, Aris and its programs have inspired students across the globe to pursue interests in science, technology, engineering, and math, and we are pleased that AX1 will join the list of missions that have contributed to this important educational work. The AX1 mission includes an international crew of four, with Axiom's Michael Lopez Alegria, XKE5GTK, a former NASA astronaut and now an Axiom Vice President. Lopez Alegria will serve as mission commander. The fourth crew member, Larry Connor, will serve as the pilot. The goal for the AX-1 crew is to set a standard for all future private astronaut missions in terms of our preparation and professionalism, Lopez Alegria said in a NASA news release. Down the road, Axiom will build modules that will attach to the ISS. Axiom will fly its own Hub-1 space station in the future. A study reported in Nature, satellite megaconstellations create risks in low Earth orbit, the atmosphere, and on Earth. In Scientific Reports, by Aaron C. Boley and Michael Byers, says the rapid development of megaconstellations risks multiple tragedies of the commons. That could include tragedies to ground-based astronomy, Earth orbit, and Earth's upper atmosphere. The study asserts that international cooperation is urgently needed, along with a regulatory system that takes into account the effects of tens of thousands of satellites. The connections between the Earth and space environments are inadequately taken into account by the adoption of a consumer electronic model applied to space assets, the author said. For example, we point out that the satellite re-entries from the Starlink mega constellation alone could deposit more aluminum into Earth's upper atmosphere than what is done through meteoroids. They could thus become the dominant source of high-altitude alumina. The authors say their study shows that untracked debris will lead to potentially dangerous on-orbit collisions on a regular basis due to the large number of satellites within mega-constellation orbital shells. The total cross-section of satellites in these constellations also greatly increases the risk of impacts due to meteoroids. De facto orbit occupation by single actors, inadequate regulatory frameworks, and the possibility of free riding exacerbate these risks. According to Boley and Byers, in two years, the number of active and defunct satellites in low Earth orbit, or LEO satellites, has increased by over 50%. SpaceX alone is on track to add 11,000 more as it builds its Starlink mega constellation and has already filed for permission for another 30,000 satellites with the FCC. There are researchers who are concerned with the Kessler syndrome, which refers to a collisional cascade of satellites. More than 12,000 trackable debris pieces are already in low Earth orbit, typically 10 centimeters in diameter or larger, the study asserts. Including sizes down to one centimeter would raise the debris count to about a million inferred debris pieces that could threaten satellites, spacecraft, and astronauts due to their orbits crisscrossing at high relative speeds. Simulations of the long-term evolution of debris suggest that LEO is already in the protracted initial stages of a mushrooming collision scenario, but that this could be managed through active debris removal. The addition of satellite megaconstellations and the general proliferation of low-cost satellites in LEO stresses the environment further, the study posits. In case you missed the earlier announcement, Dayton Hamvention 2022 is on. Here with all the details on what's to be an exciting Hamvention this year, we go to Ellsworth, Maine, where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this report. Hamvention General Chairman Rick Allnut, WSAG, said this week, he said many Hamvention volunteers attended the recent Orlando Hamcation in Florida and were encouraged to see so many friends at that show. Allnut spoke recently with Tim Duffy, K3LR, for his DX Engineering YouTube show. Rick, you know, one of the things I get asked about all the time is... What about the food vendors at Hamvention? Can you can you talk about that, Rick? 
One of the things that was true about Hera as a place, God rest its soul, uh, was that the food wasn't all that good. And one of the things that uh, that the committee that helped to choose the fairgrounds as uh, the location and in negotiation with the, uh, the Greene County Fairgrounds is we insisted that the food that's going to be available is of a much higher quality. So, so we have really tasty f- food of a lot of different kinds, not just hamburgers and hot dogs. Many Hamvention tickets were sold at the pre-show price and are also available on the Hamvention website. Hamvention, an ARRL-sanctioned event, will be held May 20th through the 22nd at the Greene County Fairgrounds and Expo Center in Xenia, Ohio. And, of course, ARRL Expo will be there. It's going to be wonderful, all not told DX Engineering's Tim Duffy. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The aisles at the Orlando Cam Nation were full of people, and the vendors appeared pleased with the brisk business. And the Hamvention booth was bombarded with well-wishers and folks with one question on their mind. Are you going to have Hamvention this year? All that said, it's been a pleasure to assure everyone that Hamvention 2022 is a go. All that noted that he and Michael Calter, WHCI, were interviewed during a DX Engineering YouTube video on February 22nd and unveiled the official logo for Hamvention 2022. This year's theme of reunion celebrates the return to a world of hams getting together after missing two Hamventions and commemorates the history of Dayton Hamvention, which stretches back 70 years to 1952. Ticket sales are very brisk, Calter said. The community is very excited about things. There have been improvements made at the Expo Center, and they're totally on our side working with us. They said both he and Allnut were at the Orlando Camcation, which he called very successful, and a good omen for Hamvention's success in 2022. We don't consider it a competition among shows, Calter said. We're all working together to make amateur radio much better. Hamvention will also feature ARRL's Expo, a large assembly of ARRL-sponsored exhibits, activities, and representatives for ARRL programs and services. Several ARRL-sponsored presentations and forums will be given. Information will be posted to ARRL.org slash expo as it becomes available. Calter also highly recommended attending Contest University on May 19th at the Hope Hotel, which takes place on the Thursday before Hamvention as an adjunct to the Hamvention experience. Germany's National Amateur Radio Society, the DARC, reports that an online training course was held in 2021 and as a result, 51 people have now passed an amateur radio exam and got their license. 34 achieved the Class A license that permits 750 watts and this is equivalent to the full Harrick license. 17 achieved the Class E license, the novice level, that permits 100 watts. The DARC's Andreas Delta Juliet 3 Echo India said that they wish all newly licensed a lot of fun with many new possibilities of our wonderful hobby. And to all those who are still learning, they wish a lot of success. While Germany has now run an online amateur radio training course, the exams are not available online and have to be done in person at one of the limited number of sites designated by the communications regulator BNETS A. In March 2021, Germany's Amateur Radio Round Table asked BNETS A to introduce online exams, but as yet nothing appears to have happened. In the UK, online exams that people can do from home have proved very popular. Stanford University scientists are taking another look at a battery technology that could prove to be a game changer. In his ARRL Eclectic Tech podcast, host Steve Ford, WB8IMY, recently discussed the chlorine battery. The alkaline metal chlorine battery boasts high energy density. Earlier versions of this technology, however, were not suitable for recharging. In a regular rechargeable battery, the electrons travel from one side to the other during discharging and then they revert back to their original form as the battery is recharged. But in the old style chlorine batteries, the sodium chloride or lithium chloride is converted to chlorine and that's way too reactive to be converted back to chloride, at least not very efficiently. All you chemistry majors are following along of course, right? The research solved this problem by making a new electrode material out of porous carbon and it acts like a sponge. 
soaking up the nasty chlorine molecules, safely storing them to be converted back into sodium chloride. When it's time to recharge, the trapped chlorine gets converted to NaCl, otherwise known as good old table salt, and it's ready to store power once again. So far, they've subjected their prototype battery to more than 200 charge and discharge cycles without any problems, and they're sure they can push that number much higher. ARRL will offer four sessions of the Teachers Institute on Wireless Technology in June and July as part of its educational outreach to schools through the Education and Technology Program. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, has more from the ARRL. The Teachers Institute is an expenses-paid professional development program intended to provide teachers with tools and strategies to introduce basic electronics, the science of radio, space technology and satellite communications, weather science, microcontrollers, robotics, and amateur radio to their students. Class sizes are limited to 12. The deadline to apply is May 1st. Sessions this summer will be held in Newington, Connecticut and in Dayton, Ohio. There are two levels, TI-1, Introduction to Wireless Technology, and TI-2, Remote Sensing and Data Analysis. TI-1 is a prerequisite for TI-2. All you want to know is at www.arrl.org forward slash education hyphen technology hyphen program. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The curriculum is designed for motivated teachers and other school staff who want to learn more about wireless technology, gain hands-on experience, and bring that knowledge to their students. I invite you to apply and to share this incredible opportunity with schools and teachers ARRL Education and Learning Manager Steve Goodgame, K5ATA, said. Goodgame said to contact him via email with any questions. TI2 focuses on the basic electronics of sensors such as temperature, pressure, position, humidity, and so on, converting analog sensor data to a digital format, programming the microcontroller to read and interpret the data, and using radio to send the sensor data to the user. After learning the basics of remote sensing, teachers assemble a sensor package to collect environmental data remotely. A 2022 brochure is available from the Teachers Institute on Wireless Technology webpage. An explanatory video is also available. The ARRL Teachers Institute recognizes that science, technology, engineering, and mathematics instruction must focus on the connection among these fields. Because it is the teacher's role to make these connections for students, teachers need to know the science and math content and understand, in sufficient detail, the technologies used in order to make the connections for their students. The Teachers Institute is only the beginning of a participant's exploration of wireless technology. The goal of the TI program is to equip each school teacher with necessary foundational knowledge and, through hands-on learning, generate the inspiration for teachers to continue to explore wireless technology and adapt relevant content into their classroom instruction. This training serves as an excellent foundation for school teachers interested in including classroom learning about radio communications and wireless technology as part of student preparation for participation in the amateur radio on the International Space Station program. This in-service training program is supported entirely by generous philanthropic donations. The Teachers Institute opportunities are virtually free for participants. The grant to attend a TI covers transportation, hotel, a modest per diem to cover meals, instructional resources for the electronics, microcontroller, and robotics segments of the course, and a resource library of relevant ARRL publications. The primary out-of-pocket expense is a $100 enrollment fee. Graduate credits are available through Fresno Pacific University upon completion of the TI-1 or TI-2 programs. 
These credits can be used to satisfy professional growth requirements to maintain teaching credentials. The class is self-contained and participants are expected to be able to complete all requirements during the class time. Qualified applicants must be active teachers at an elementary, middle, or high school, at a college or university, or in a leadership or enrichment instruction role in an after-school or collective homeschool program. An amateur radio license is not required for the introductory workshop TI-1, but is required for the advanced TI-2 program. It's time for Ask the Tech Guy a question all about how long SSDs last. Next. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Let's talk tech, you and me. We're having a fun time. This is like a little user group here. I bought a new iMac with an internal SSD, solid state drive. How long under normal use, I'm not a power user, should it last? I've heard SSD's cells start to fail after a while. So this is a common misconception about SSDs, that they're somehow not going to last as long. And in fact, they wouldn't, except for some very sophisticated circuitry in the controller of the solid state drive. This circuitry does something called wear leveling. See, the problem is that the memory cells on any solid state memory, NAND memory, will wear out after many, many uses. You can write to them only so many times, and then they'll just stop taking data. To prevent this from happening on an SSD, the controller software, the firmware, uses something called wear leveling to even out the wear across all the cells. There are many cells, billions of cells on a modern SSD, so by wear leveling, they can make sure no one cell gets written to too many times. And my experience with SSDs has been they are just as reliable, in fact, probably more reliable than any spinning drive. There are no moving parts, after all, and uh, they don't get as hot. Uh, there's no actuator arm. There's no spinning disc. So it kind of makes sense. A solid state drive should last a good long time. So early fears that SSDs would be fragile have really proven unfounded. Our friend Alan Mal Malventano, who was a PCPC perspective, now works at Intel, was my SSD guru from the very earliest days of solid state drives. And he agrees SSDs are very, very reliable these days. We did have a friend uh, who, in the earliest days of SSDs, tried using an SSD as his swap disk for Windows, burned it out very quickly. But again, this was in the early days, pre-wear leveling. Tony did say he'd found a program that uh, for his Mac called Drive DX, which would give him information about how his drive had fared and its overall health rating and would even give a time left indicator on the drive. I had to give him the bad news that this is a program like many and I downloaded it and bought it. It's $20. Good thing to have, but it's using something called smart and smart technology is unfortunately not as smart as it sounds. S-M-A-R-T, which uh, stands for Self-Monitoring Analysis and Reporting Technology. It was created, I think, with the best of intentions for hard disk drives, spinning drives. But the manufacturers really decided not to give it all the power it might have because they didn't want pop-ups showing up saying your drive is about to die. And that was what Smart was supposed to do. So Smart is somewhat limited in its capability of diagnosing drive failure. Still, this uh, Drive DX is actually pretty cool. It shows you all sorts of information about your drive and gives it an overall grade for lifetime left and health rating. Uh, in fact, Tony's drive said he had a, one issue, a failing indicator pre-fail on lifespan. Don't know what that means. And Drive DX said your lifetime is good, 100%. So I wouldn't worry about it. SSDs last as long, if not longer, than spinning drives. These days, they're so reliable, and they're so much faster than spinning drives that I think you're going to be better off putting an SSD in wherever you can. The only negative on solid-state drives is the price. They're slightly more expensive per gigabit, gigabyte than spinning drives, but that price is dropping dramatically. For myself, whenever I buy a new computer, I put a solid-state drive in. I don't use spinning drives anymore. Uh, except maybe in my network attached storage device. And that's only because I want a huge amount of capacity for as little price as possible. So SSDs, 
safe, reliable. They're going to last a long time. Buy them, use them. You're going to be happy. Uh, let's see. What else can we talk about? Backing up Windows 10 automatically. Well, there are lots of ways to do this. Backup is, of course, really important. If you don't make a copy of your most vital documents, you'll lose them. You're almost guaranteed you'll lose them. Now, I'm going to say before we tell you how to do it, what you should back up. In general, you don't need to back up Windows. You don't need to back up your apps. Anything that you can download or reinstall yourself, don't bother backing it up. There's already a copy somewhere else out there. You want to back up the stuff only you have. Pictures of your babies or of your wedding, uh, documents, emails, things like um, financial records. You know, the most important stuff you have is stuff you created and you have the only copy of. That's the stuff you need to back up. And of course, I always refer to my friend Peter Krogh. He's a great photographer, wrote the Digital Asset Management book. Photographers are absolutely crazy about backing up and he's the guy who coined the term three two one backup three copies of everything if you delete the original then you only have two copies so you want to have three copies of everything two different forms of backup so you're not relying on any kind of media or or software and finally one of those backups should be in the cloud i'll talk about all three of these things in just a second microsoft builds in a couple of backup solutions into windows 10. one of them is the strangely named file history file file history is believe it or not a backup solution. This is Microsoft's own support article. You go, you click the start menu, go to settings, update and security, and you'll see in there, there is a backup entry, uh, and then click that and add a drive. You can choose an external drive. You, Microsoft points out you could also use a network location for your backups. Having an external drive always connected to your computer, you can use file history to automatically backup files and it does this with versioning so it will keep as many versions of the file as if you have room on your hard drive you might want to check the settings and make sure that you don't uh, just keep backing up till your hard drive's full you might want to say only keep 10 copies or only keep copies for six months there are a variety of choices uh, there but this is very handy for keeping not only a copy of your documents but as you change a document let's say you've changed your will keeping all the copies for a period of time that have been made. So that's called file history. And that's why the name kind of makes sense. It doesn't mention backup, but that's what it is. It's backing up your files and keeping a history of them. I think that's a good solution. And it does have an automatic feature to it. But there's an even more automatic way to do this. And that's with Microsoft's old school. They call it legacy backup. You'll find it in the system and security control panel under backup and restore Windows 7. Don't be put off by the name Windows 7. This is still working on Windows 10. It's just their old school uh, way to do it. So let me show you some of the screenshots here of what it looks like because you shouldn't be scared away from it. So backup and restore under Windows 7 allows you to do it automatically to an external drive, either on a schedule or when the drive is connected. You might want to schedule it, say, every day to do an incremental backup, that is backup the things that are changed. This is probably the backup most people are familiar with and used to, and it's a perfectly fine system. You can use it uh, reliably, and like file history, it's free, and it comes with Windows 10. Notice on the page, there's an additional entry, create a system image. Let me talk a little bit about what images are. Uh, we used to call them ghosts from the program Norton Ghost. That was a really old program for taking everything on a hard drive and bundling it into a single file, kind of like a freeze-dried version of the drive, a moment in time. Those are really handy for any time that you want to get a system back up and running quickly. For instance, you buy a new hard drive. You can take an image file and blast it onto the new hard drive. It'll be identical to the old drive you made the image from. So it's very useful for that. I almost always make images when I'm first installing Windows. I'll, I'll do two images. First, I'll install Windows, get it running on a machine, just plain vanilla Windows. I'll make an image 
file then. And you can make the image to an external drive, to a thumb drive. You can even put it on a CD or a DVD if you want. It's nice to have those lying around because that means you don't have to go through the Windows install process on that machine ever again. You just blast the image back, gets it right back to the brand new fresh install of Windows. I usually make a second image after I install all the apps I know I'm going to want, get everything configured like the Wi-Fi, all the passwords, get my last pass going, all of that. And then I'll make a second image. And that image is usually the one I'll use, which gets me back to that point in time when I had a fresh system properly configured and running. The problem with image backups is they don't record anything after you make that image. They're a point in time. And if you change one file, then that change is not saved. The image backup, you know, brings you back to that point in time. Sometimes people use images, they restore, and then they're disappointed they've lost so much. It's because you weren't backing it up. So images, is uh, imaging backup, you can do it with the System 7, Windows 7 Legacy Backup. It's a great thing to do, but don't think of it as your whole backup strategy. You still want to use file history or the Windows 7 Legacy Backup to back up changed files. They call that incremental backup, backing up all the files that have changed since your last image. There are lots of other third-party tools as well. Those are the two that come with Windows. They're free. The one thing I'm not crazy about, and a lot of backup programs do this, they make a blob. You, you can inspect what's in the blob and so forth, but there's no way to see if that file is intact and is, is properly backed up. You can't just open it. You, you know, it's sitting there in the blob. So I always like to do backups that make an exact directory of the file structure so I can go and look and see that all the files are there and even spot check them by opening them up. That's just a personal preference. Lots of people have used Windows Backup uh, since the Windows 7 days and are perfectly happy with it. If you want to look at other offerings, there are excellent free and paid offerings from EaseUS. That's at E-A-S-E-U-S dot com. They have data recovery backup. They have a partition manager. They also have an imaging program. Acronis is very well known for its imaging program, True Image, but they also have other backup software. You can use True Image 2020 to both backup and create disk images. There's also a company called Macrium, M-A-C-R-I-U-M, and their Macrium Reflect has a free edition you can use to, to do backups. So all of those uh, are perfectly good. You take your pick. Honestly, the ones that come with Windows are generally what I use. But remember, it isn't enough to make a local backup of your most important stuff. You want to make sure, as I mentioned, that you make an off-site copy. So you might go to a company like iDrive. Uh, there are many ways to do this to backup to the cloud. Another solution, and this is the one I use, just so you know, it's a little bit more expensive, but it's a lot more flexible. I use a network attached storage or NAS device. I use one from Synology. I have that NAS in a closet at home and I can put software on all of our systems, our phones, everything we have to automatically back up periodically to that drive in the closet over the network. That means I always have all the data on that drive in the closet. Synology NASes come with software. They actually, you can use iDrive or other software to back up to the cloud so you can have that NAS backed up. If you don't want to spend the money on a subscription to a cloud service, you can even get a second NAS, it's probably more expensive, and keep a, the identical NAS at work and have those two synchronized. That's actually what I do. I have a Synology NAS here, one at home, and they keep in sync. So I have a copy off-site, a copy at home, and those are always available to me. There's lots of ways, in other words, uh, to do this. A NAS is more expensive, but also much more flexible, and you control the backup. No one else has an access to it. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high-tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip? Into amateur radio history, I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. And now with this week's edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here's Bill Continelli, W2XOY. The early 1950s were not a time of peace and security in the United States. The Korean War was in full force with the constant threat of communist Chinese intervention. The Iron Curtain cut Eastern Europe off from the rest of the free world. The Soviet Union developed their own atomic weapons. Communists, real and imagined, roamed the United States with Senator Joseph McCarthy in hot pursuit. Writers, actors, and directors suffered under the Hollywood blacklist. In other words, the fabulous 50s 
were still a couple of years away. Amateurs were on the air, but many feared that the FCC would eventually suspend operations as they had during World War II. Amazingly, despite what QST called a national emergency, there was no civil defense program in place to utilize amateur radio operators in the case of enemy attack or natural disasters. The previous civil defense program, the War Emergency Radio Service, WERS for short, had been out of service since 1949. Even in its heyday, WERS had many shortcomings. It wasn't established until June 1942, seven months after the war started. It was limited to the two and a half and one and a quarter meter amateur bands with no HF frequencies. Finally, WES operations, other than on the air drills, were limited to actual enemy activity. There was no provision for WERS to be used during natural disasters. The AWRL, FCC, and the civil defense leaders learned from the mistakes of WERS and were determined to have a viable radio civil defense program in place when it was needed. Thus, on December 19, 1951, at the same time that Conrad was announced, the FCC released the proposed regulations for RACES, the Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service. On August 15, 1952, the final RACES regulations were put into effect. Amateur radio operators now had a civil defense program in place that would utilize their communication skills. Before a RACES unit could be authorized, there were some requirements that had to be met. First, the local government needed a civil defense organization and a communications plan. The local plan had to be approved at the state civil defense level. Next was the appointment of the RACES radio officer. The radio officer, or RO for short, had to hold a conditional, general, advanced, or extra-class amateur license, or a first or second-class commercial radio telegraph or radio telephone license. The potential radio officer submitted FCC Form 482 to receive the certification, provided, of course, that they passed the loyalty investigation. Note that the radio officer did not need to be an amateur. The FCC and civil defense experts determined that about 25,000 amateurs might be available for RACES authorization. However, in a full-scale national emergency, up to 200,000 radio operators would be needed. Thus, provisions were incorporated for qualified commercial class licensees to become a part of the RACES program. After the communications plan was approved and the radio officer was certified, station authorizations could be issued. Amateurs submitted FCC Form 481 to have their station license made valid for RACES operation. Novices and technicians were not eligible for RACES authorizations. The FCC and the AWRL emphasized that membership in RACES was not an invitation to continue casual amateur radio activity in a war. RACES was strictly dedicated to public service under the direction and control of the local CD unit. The frequencies initially allocated to RACES were 1,800 to 2,000 kilocycles, subject to Loran restrictions, 3,500 to 3,510 kilocycles, 3,990 to 4,000 kilocycles, 28.55 to 28.75 megacycles, 29.45 to 29.65 megacycles, 50.35 to 50.75 megacycles, 53.35 to 53.75 megacycles, 145.17 to 145.71 megacycles, 146.79 to 147.33 megacycles, and 220 to 225 megacycles. In addition, 1750 to 1800 kilocycles, which was outside of our 160 meter band, was allowed under disaster communications services. Note that the initial frequencies did not include the 40, 20, and 15 meter bands. The 15 meter band was not yet available to amateurs when RACES was first proposed. Later, 40, 20, and 15 were added, and the 75 meter phone segment was expanded. Reaction to the RACES frequencies was mixed. Some were upset that they were insufficient and were not exclusive to RACES. Others thought of it as a diabolical plot on the part of government agencies and commercial interests to grab parts of the amateur bands for non-amateur use by non-amateur personnel. 
Racy's was never used during an enemy attack. Over the years, however, it proved its value in countless natural disasters. Frequencies were expanded, and novices and technicians were brought into the field. One interesting fact about Racy's, it was designed to be a temporary service. The initial regulations indicated that it would be discontinued after the termination of the national emergency. Conrad has been gone for over 45 years, and the fallout shelter signs are rusting away on the walls of abandoned buildings. Why does Racy's, a temporary service, still live? The answer is found in every natural disaster that hits the U.S. Every tornado, hurricane, flood, earthquake, blizzard, and fire. Every time dedicated amateurs, working with their local civil defense officials, provide effective emergency communications, they keep a temporary service alive. In our next installment, we will explore long-delayed echoes. Is there a natural explanation? Or were they truly something out of this world? This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for This Week in Amateur Radio. The 2022 running of the Armed Forces Day Crossband Exercise will be held on May 14th from 1300 to 2200 UTC. With more details on this annual crossband event, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report. A complete list of participating stations, modes, frequencies, times, and other details will be announced on April 1st. The event is open to all radio amateurs. Armed Forces Day is May 21st, but the Armed Forces Day Crossband Military Amateur Radio event traditionally takes place a week earlier in order to avoid conflicting with Dayton Hamvention. During the exercise, radio amateurs listen for stations on military operating frequencies and transmit on frequencies in adjacent amateur bands. Military and amateur stations have taken part in this event for more than 50 years. It's an exercise scenario designed to include ham radio and government radio operators alike. Military stations in various locations will transmit on selected military frequencies and announce the specific ham band frequency they are monitoring. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. For previous announcements, the Armed Forces Day Crossband Test is a unique opportunity to test two-way communications between military communicators and radio stations in the amateur radio service. These tests provide opportunities and challenges for radio operators to demonstrate individual technical skills in a tightly controlled exercise scenario that does not impact any public or private communication. An Armed Forces Day message will be transmitted using the military standard serial PSK waveform M110, followed by the military standard wide shift FSK, that's 850 hertz RTTY, as described in the military standard 188-110A stroke B. The Armed Forces Day message will also be sent in CW and on standard RTTY. Once again, the full details for this event will be released on April 1st, 2022. This is November 3, Victor Echo Mike from the Parks on the Air News Desk with your month ending February 2022 Parks on the Air update. Be sure to visit parksontheair.com for information about the program and poda.app for spotting, park information, leaderboards, and more. And now we'll get started with Parks on the Air News. Parks on the Air is excited to welcome a new batch of DX entities to the program this month. Be on the lookout for new parks getting added in Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Kingdom of Eswatini, Bolivia, Paraguay, Uruguay, Suriname, Guyana, Cuba, Trinidad and Tobago, and the Falkland Islands. If your country or one you'd like to represent is not yet part of POTA, please reach out via the Contact Us link from parksontheair.com and we'll help you get started as a volunteer country administrator. In upcoming events, we hope you join us for the upcoming Spring Support Your Parks event on April 16th and 17th UTC. We also hope you'll join us this summer for our very popular annual plaque event on July 16th and 17th UTC. There will be three new plaques available for DX activators this year, one each for stations activating outside of the continental U.S. in IARU regions 1, 2, and 3. Sponsorship opportunities will be opening at the end of March, so if you or your club is interested in sponsoring a plaque, please send an email to n3vem at parksontheair.com. 
due to steady growth and improving conditions that make a possible to, as KN4MQR said on Twitter, load up a wet pasta noodle and get pile-ups for hours, we are expecting a very large turnout for this summer's event. And now for the monthly stats update. February had a lot of activity for being the shortest month of the year. With an average of 270 activations happening every day, there ended up being just under 1,500 operators who did approximately 7,500 activations. They did this from over 3,000 different parks in 31 different DX entities. Top activators for the month were N2NWK, who did 217 activations, and K4NYM, who activated 78 different parks. The top hunter for the month was KO4GAR, who hunted 1,044 parks while making 1,796 QSOs as a hunter. In our POTA DX corner, the busiest countries have held their spots, with England as our Region 1 leader at 87 activations, Canada as our Region 2 leader with approximately 285 activations, and Japan as our Region 3 and overall DX leader with 362 activations. The top DX activator for the month was JI1ORE with 40 activations from 39 different parks. This is the second month in a row where our overall DX leader was from Region 1. Congratulations! And last but not least, let's check in on the progress of the Bailey Sprott Challenge. In 2021, N5HA and W9AV each managed to hunt a park every day, so in 2022, we're following along to see if anyone else can match their feet. At 59 days into the year, we have five activators who have activated every day of the year, N2NWK, KE8PZN, K4NYM, KD4MZM, and KB3WAV. The pool of hunters still in the running has shrunk considerably, down from 91 last month to just 53. To all of the Bailey Sprott participants, congrats on your success so far, and we look forward to seeing how you do throughout the year. This concludes our February 2022 Parks on the Air update. As always, the team at Parks on the Air wishes you safe activations and happy hunting. 73. Foundations of Amateur Radio. After weeks of attempting to get some noise, any noise, out of my Pluto SDR, I have finally cracked it. Not sure if cracked it refers to my sanity or the outcome, but beeping was heard from the Pluto on my radio. So I'm doing victory laps around the house, all conquering hero type affair, complete with whooping and hand waving. In the end, it all came down to serendipity, and truth be told, I know it beeps. I've heard it beep. It does so on a predictable frequency. But why it exactly works is still a mystery that is yet to be discovered, since the documentation I have isn't sharing and the example code I have contradicts what I'm seeing. For context, a Pluto SDR, or Pluto, is a very capable software-defined radio, perfect for experimentation. I've talked about it before in the context of using it as a receiver. My most recent efforts involved coaxing my Pluto out of a corner after it sat there sulking for weeks, Turns out that not only was my USB power lead broken, which caused the blinking lights to stay off, when I finally figured that out, I discovered that one of the two wireless dongles I'd purchased together was dead on arrival. After a frustrating morning with the manufacturer who wouldn't take my word for it that swapping out the two identical units would not require installing the driver, something about Windows Device Manager on my Linux computer, I went back to the store who happily swapped out the faulty device on the spot. Mind you, the Pluto still isn't talking to my wireless network, but at least it's not the dongle anymore. I plugged the Pluto into the back of my main workstation and discovered to my surprise that in addition to showing up as a thumb drive, which I knew about, it also turned up as a network device, which I didn't know about. It's been a while since I powered this up to play, so I updated the firmware which fixed some annoying issues and started to explore. The aim of my quest was to create a proof of concept beep from the command line on the Pluto. If you're not familiar with this, the Pluto is running a flavor of Linux. You can connect to its command line and run commands from inside the hardware. This is important because for most radios of both the analog and software kind, you generate the information somewhere, like Morse code, a whisper signal, your voice, whatever, and then you send that to the radio. On an analog radio, it's likely to go across an audio cable of some sort. And if you have a software-defined radio, it's likely to travel from your computer across a USB or network cable to the radio to get processed. This is different in that there is no such signal coming across the USB link. 
The link is used as a network cable to SSH into the radio, where you can generate whatever you want. In my case, Morse. If you're not familiar with SSH, think of it as a keyboard connection to a remote computer. My script, hacked together as it is, more on that shortly, takes a string like, say, CQDEVK6FLAB, and processes that character by character. It converts each into the equivalent Morse code dits and dars, and then uses those to turn on a test tone for an appropriate amount of time. So, to send CQ, the script changes that into da dit da dit, da da dit da, and then turns on the transmitter for three units, off for one, on for one, off for one, on for three, off for one, etc. This is Morse code at its very simplest, the software equivalent of holding down a Morse key for the correct amount of time and then releasing it. I disparagingly called it hacked together because it's using the inbuilt BusyBox command shell that comes with the Pluto. If you're familiar, the actual shell is called Ash or Almquist shell. It's strictly limited in functionality, no arrays, minimal redirection, all very basic. Perfect for what I want to do, but not so much if you want to write software. After working around the lack of arrays, one of the things that caused me the most problems was to discover just how to set up the Pluto to actually do this. I found a couple of examples online that pretended to work, claimed to be doing what they said they were, but nothing was heard on my local analog radio. At one point I heard clicks, but no beeping. After spending literally hours testing scanning up and down the radio dial with my Yaesu FT-857D, I stumbled on a tone that stopped when my test script stopped. I started the script again, and the tone came back. When it ended, the tone stopped again. I finally had a relationship between a tone on the Pluto SDR and the frequency on my radio. So, with all manner of funky offsets in my code, subject to me understanding the how and what of them, I can now beep to my heart's content. Of course, I have shared my efforts on GitHub, cunningly called Pluto Beacon. Have a look and tell me what I did wrong. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. The ARRL has filed comments with the United States Forest Service seeking an exemption for amateur radio facilities to a proposed new $1,400 annual administrative fee. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, is here with more details on this new proposed fee and comments proposed by the ARRL. The USFS proposal resulted from requirements in the Farm Bill of 2018, which directs the Forest Service to collect fees in order to recover costs to the agency, sort of like the yet-to-be-imposed FCC ham radio application fees. The $1,400 proposed fee is on top of fees such as rent already being paid. Existing fees generally have been in the $130 to $140 a year class for amateur uses. The comment filing window has been reopened and extended, so additional comments will be accepted through March 31st. If you missed the first comment period or have more to say, go for it. ARRL stressed that equipment, maintenance, and other costs associated with amateur radio facilities on U.S. Forest Service lands are, quote, borne solely by the volunteer radio amateurs themselves. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Although the discussion put forward by the Forest Service in its proposed focuses on commercial uses, the proposal would sweep within its requirements amateur radio uses that are solely non-commercial, ARRL said in its comments filed on February 22nd. Radio amateurs establish and maintain facilities at certain locations for public service purposes with no remuneration or reimbursement. Unlike broadcasters and commercial wireless and fiber providers, radio amateurs are uniquely barred by the terms of their federal licenses from receiving compensation of any sort. Non-commercial and uncompensated communication uses by radio amateurs within forest service areas long have served the public interest in many ways, among them by providing the means for otherwise unobtainable emergency communication capabilities in times of need, the ARRL noted. Amateurs perform this valuable public service without cost to taxpayers. The importance of these capabilities has been demonstrated repeatedly. The skills of radio amateur operators have served our country well with their carefully located equipment 
when enabling exchanges of possibly life-saving messages in difficult terrain during forest fires, extending communications assistance help during hurricanes, and providing communication capabilities during search and rescue missions in remote areas. It is foreseeable that many radio amateurs providing these services would have to opt to withdraw and cease their work if not exempted from the proposed fees, the AWRL said. In many cases, the most useful locations for needed coverage from their stations is uniquely on Forest Service lands. In short, the proposal to include volunteer, uncompensated amateur service applicants with the commercial wireless service and broadcast applicants is grossly inequitable. There is a disparity in the amount of resources necessary to consider applications from radio amateurs as compared to that required by commercial applicants. Our best estimate is that there are fewer than 100 covered amateur locations, but those likely are unique and essential to covering forested areas in times of need, such as forest fires or lost hikers, the AWRL said. These dissimilarities in complexity and scope should be recognized in the fees proposal and amateur radio applicants exempted. As an example, Hams in Michigan who provide emergency communications have told local officials that because they rely on the use of tower located inside a national forest, they may now face a new fee of $1,400 to operate. As another example, according to a report in the Manistee News, the Manistee County Amateur Radio Operators Club received notice from the U.S. Forest Service that there might be a fee for their use of the tower. Forest Service officials announced in December that they have proposed such fees for any communications users, including cellular phone providers, maintaining permanent equipment on Forest Service land. Time now for the AMSAT report. AMSAT has just received a generous grant from the Amateur Radio Digital Communications for the development of a three-unit space frame with deployable solar panels. The standardized 3U CubeSat space frame will serve as the mechanical platform for AMSAT's Golf series of satellites as well as for a new generation of low earth orbit FM satellites. Central to the development of the 3U space frame, AMSAT will build three flight ready space frames for an upcoming series of satellites with potentially enhanced flight control, payload and communication capabilities. The need for a three unit space frame with deployable solar panels goes back to the original design requirements for the greater orbit, larger footprint or golf satellites that would return AMSAT to highly elliptical orbits. The benefit of this program will provide satellites with wider coverage and longer access times to the entire amateur radio satellite community worldwide. Thanks to Frank and 1UW, AMSAT's Vice President of Development, for this update. The AMSAT report comes to us each week courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. We all know that the height of an antenna is important, but we may not know how important and all the reasons and benefits it can bring. Ian Poole of Electronics Notes has just released a video showing how antenna height at VHF and UHF brings some significant benefits for professional radio and broadcasting as well as amateur radio. The benefits are significant and warrant many antennas being located in high positions and on towers, but this comes at a cost. In his video, there are also some good general points to note as well, as the antenna rises higher above the ground. Find out what you need to know in Ian's video by searching YouTube for the title Antenna Height, Why It Is Important. It's time for the weekly propagation forecast report brought to us each week by Ted Cook, K7RA in Seattle, Washington, who reports that on March 11th at 0431 UTC, Australia's Space Forecast Center issued this warning. A slow coronal mass ejection has been observed late on March 10th and the event modeling suggests arrival at the Earth late on March 13th. Increased geomagnetic activity is expected for March 14th, 2022. We observed an active sun this week. Geomagnetic indicators peaked on Saturday, March 5th, when Alaska's High Latitude College A index reached 42. Again this week, sunspots covered the sun every day. 
Average daily sunspot numbers rose from 44 to 87.4, and the average daily solar flux went from 98.5 to 115.5. Geomagnetic indicators were also higher. Average daily planetary A and dice increased from 7.3 to 11.4. So, looking ahead, the predicted solar flux is 120 on March 11th through the 12th, 115 on March 13th, 110 on March 14th through the 16th, and 105 on March 17th. Looking at the planetary A index now, it'll be 12 on March 11th, 5 on March 12th and 13th, 10, 18, 15, 5, and 8, respectively, on March 14th through the 18th. The Radio Society of Great Britain has released its board proceedings for the meeting held on January the 15th, 2022, in PDF format. They note that in 2021, the numbers taking the RSGB amateur radio exams were 2,303 at foundation level, 750 at intermediate, and 574 candidates took the full license level exam. The percentage that passed isn't given. RSGB members can read the RSGB board proceedings at rsgb.org. Just head for the About Us section. And you can join the RSGB online at www.rsgbshop.org. And RSGB membership is free to licensed UK amateurs under the age of 21 or aged 21 to 25 and in full-time education. And the RSGB has announced that its legacy committee has agreed to fund a 50 MHz beacon specifically to study meteor events above the UK. The RSGB website says that unlike conventional propagation beacons, this will beam vertically up using circular polarization. The 50 MHz band is particularly suitable for observing meteors by radio as they create an ionized trail strongly reflective to radio at that frequency while they burn up on entry to the Earth's atmosphere. This is a collaborative project between the amateur radio and radio astronomy communities and will enable a range of radio-based citizen science and STEM projects studying meteors. The beacon is to be located at the Sherwood Observatory of the Mansfield and Sutton Astronomical Society, a central location for UK coverage. A hybrid convention is in the cards this year for the Radio Society of Great Britain, which hopes to combine a return to an in-person event with the best of the online conventions held these past two years. Planning is already underway, but the organizers are in need of a convention chair. According to the RSGB website, this leader should be someone familiar with all developments going on in amateur radio and should be comfortable planning for online events as well as those in person. Meanwhile, the team is seeking input from anyone and everyone who would like to help shape the event, which will be held in October. A survey is posted online for amateurs to share their ideas with the organizers. It's not necessary to be a member of the RSGB to participate in the survey. As with the previous two online conventions, the hybrid version will be providing access to people attending from outside Great Britain. Visit the website rsgb.org stroke convention to provide your input and learn more about the vacancy. CPAC convention registration is now open. CPAC, the largest amateur radio convention in the American Northwest, is promising sand, surf, and radios, and all of it in person this summer. Online registration opened on the 7th of March. The convention, which is happening June 3rd through the 5th, will be at Seaside Convention Center in Oregon. This will also serve as a location for the ARRL's Northwestern Division Convention. According to the CPAC website, the event will comply with whatever state and local regulations are in effect for COVID-19 at the time. A CPAC QSO party will be held on the weekend before, on May 28th, to get everyone ready for the three-day event. For registration or information, visit the website at CPAC.org. We unfortunately have a couple of significant silent keys to tell you about this week. A popular DXer and CW enthusiast known for his expeditions with his fellow hams in the Ukraine has become a silent key. DXWorld.net has reported that Ivan Lysenko, UR8GX, was killed in his home city of Kherson amid the fighting following its invasion by Russian troops. Ivan's many adventures include the expedition in the summer of 2019 to the Kalinchaksky Islands for the Islands on the Air contest. He participated with fellow members of the Ukrainian radio club Sputnik, UR6GWZ. Ivan also served as the QSL manager for UR1G, the call sign for the club's team of operators. 
His death was reported on the Facebook page of DXWorld.net, prompting hams from around the world to post their condolences and remember their QSOs with him, particularly his many DX contacts. Meanwhile, satellite pioneer Raphael Ray Soifer, W2RS, of Green Valley, Arizona, died on March 1st. An ARRL life member, he was 79. Licensed in 1955, Soifer was among those involved in founding the AMSAT organization. A native of New York City, he studied engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and then obtained an MBA at Harvard Business School. His career was in finance, serving as a news media banking commentator and banking analyst. As a 16-year-old at MIT, Soifer served as lead engineer in the AMSAT organization's satellite radio projects, including early ham satellite Oscar One. He was featured in Time Magazine in 1960 for this work. Soifer has written many articles for QST, Radcom, the AMSAT Journal, and other ham publications, mostly about satellites and moon bounce. He holds satellite DXCC number 13 and satellite Worked All Continents number 6, both earned entirely via low Earth orbit spacecraft. Soifer participated in the first two way contact in any radio service via satellite to satellite relay with W 2 BXA, also silent key, via AMSAT Oscar 7 and AMSAT Oscar 6 in 1975, as well as the first known contact via satellite ionization trail reflection, a propagation mode first reported by W 8 JK, now silent key, in 1958. He was active on two meter moon bounce from 1985 until 1995. Other call signs held over the years include K1WXC, K2QBW, WA4IJR, and G3DDU. The personal radio collection of the late Pat Herbert is to be sold at a forthcoming auction. He established Ye Old Hurdy Gurdy Museum of Vintage Radio in Howth, a town to the east of Dublin in Ireland. The Irish Times newspaper reports that his private collection of old radios, gramophones and phonographs, along with a large collection of other non-radio items, will be auctioned in March. Mr Herbert spent 17 years at his museum in Howth until his death in 2020, and his family intend to continue to celebrate his legacy there. What forms this sale is the private collection he amassed since the 1950s. Over his lifetime, Mr. Herbert collected more than 500 radios and established the Vintage Radio Museum at the Martello Tower in 2003 when he retired. He started collecting radios in the mid-1950s when vinyl was introduced and also began collecting needles which form part of the sale. The collection includes thorns from the Blackthorn Flower which were used to play records due to the rationing of needles during the war years. The 1947 All-Ireland Senior Gaelic Football Championship final was the 60th All-Ireland final and it was the only one ever to take place outside Ireland at the Polo Grounds in New York, America. Pat Herbert's son Simon said that a family called the Lammons had bought a radio so the whole village in County Mayo were invited to hear the match. His dad, who was aged 10, recalled how all the children were gathered outside the farmhouse as the inside was packed with adults. It was the first time he had ever seen artificial light, what he called the magic eye of the radio, while mesmerised by the voice of Michael O'Hare describing the match across the ocean in New York. Pat often laughed that the radio waves had fried his brain and turned him into a collector. You can read the full story at www.irishtimes.com. Head for the Life and Style section. On February 26, 22 stations representing 14 countries within International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 took part in a short-notice exercise using the geostationary satellite QO100. This was the first of a number of smaller exercises, tests, and meetings to be held by IARU Region 1 throughout the year, building on the earlier global simulated emergency tests to cover as many aspects of emergency communications as possible. The intention is to bring emergency communicators together more frequently to demonstrate how the amateur radio service can work together as a global community and develop a common understanding of each other's capabilities. The exercise was deemed a success, with a number of formal messages passed among stations and some lessons learned from the inevitable challenges of equipment failure, 
language barriers, and coordination of an exercise with a coverage area from South Africa to the United Kingdom. Once all the exercise feedback is received, another test on QL100 is planned for October 2022. QL100 brings another asset to the Emergency Communications Toolbox in Region 1, and its presence is much appreciated. IARU Region 1 Emergency Communications Coordinator Greg Mosop, G0DUB, commented. Japan Amateur Radio League President Yoshinori Takao, JG1KTC, is a member of the Ministry of Internal Affairs. The Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications released a report in November of 2021 entitled Radio Policy Council in the Age of Digital Transformation, which noted the amateur radio population is declining and amateur radio growth must continue. Young people will lead the future, the report said, considering creating an environment that makes it easier to get started in amateur radio. The government ministry said it would proceed with studies towards developing a system and environment that would make it easier to utilize amateur radio as the realization of experimental and a research environment. Another goal is to speed up the process of acquiring an amateur radio license and establishing and operating a ham radio station in Japan. The advisory board held its first meeting back on January 26th. Practical Sailor magazine has featured an article by Daryl Nicholson about eliminating radio frequency interference from fridges on board vessels. He's a marine installer who says this is a common problem, and recently he came across another boat with a radio frequency issue coming from a frigger boat refrigeration system. The boat was built with two Danfoss fridge compressors, but when one was replaced recently, the boat's single sideband radio whined when the new compressor was running. Darrell ran through the normal radio frequency isolation procedures, but he hasn't had much luck yet. It seems like radio frequency leakage might be a good topic to explore. What really works to solve it? What installation procedures are necessary? Whether you're a professional or an amateur, tracking down radio frequency problems can drive you round in loops. The manufacturer of the compressors, Danfoss, offers some guidance for tracking down and eliminating the annoying hiss that its equipment can generate on some radio frequencies. They recommend that if the noise source has several components, all of which may contribute to interference, separate each potential source to observe its effect. The vessel's battery is an effective trap for the electrical noise reaching the power connections from the noise source. To make effective use of that trap, they suggest connecting the noise source directly to the battery with the shortest length of wire possible. No other device should be connected to this run of wire. Twisting the power leads will reduce the ability of the power leads to act as an antenna. The most effective way to reduce emissions from the power leads is to use shielded cable. All accessories and control leads at the noise source should be examined. Reduce lengths to the minimum and twist and apply grounded shields as needed. It can be helpful to ground the negative power lead to the frame of the noise source. Look for a screw which can clamp a short copper strap from the negative power lead to the frame of the noise source. A filter could be applied to the main battery power supply leads close to the noise source. The current rating of this filter should be about twice the maximum current rating of the noise source. If little noise is radiated, a filter at the power connections of the affected equipment may be less costly. You can read the full article at www.practical-sailor.com. For hams in Hawaii, the three-hour emergency communications exercise being held by the Hawaii Amateur Radio Emergency Service on April 16th will be like none of the others held several times each year. This exercise will simulate a four-day period of catastrophic rain and wind covering the Hawaiian Islands from Kauai to the Big Island with loss of power, internet, and cell towers. The drill will be conducted following the Homeland Security Exercise and Evaluation Program, which standardizes terminology, methodology, and policy used during the exercise. According to Hawaii ARES spokesman Stacy Holbrook, KH6OWL, a planning team has developed a full incident action plan using the forms and format of the program's incident command system structure. Stacy said in an email he was unaware of any other statewide exercises being done in this manner. 
Using on-the-air nets, social media, and local clubs, organizers are reaching out to the more than 3,800 licensed amateurs throughout Hawaii, hoping to get as many hams as possible on board. The drill is an all-mode, all-band exercise that makes use of analog, simplex, and digital modes, as well as VHF, UHF, and HF. Hams using WinLink will have the additional support of an ongoing Zoom meeting to assist with any troubleshooting. Stacy said that they would love to build relationships with the fire chiefs, police chiefs, and served agencies in our area so they know they have another asset they could use if needed. He said the goal is to use the ICS system so that everyone is on the same training level and gets the needed experience with the command structure and forms. Approximately one hour in the drill will represent one day of the simulated storm. Radio amateurs planning to participate should register in advance. There is additional information in a sign-up form on the website, hawaiiares.net. And now, with his segment on how to successfully compose a public service announcement to promote your radio club meeting or ham fest on local broadcast radio, here is... Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. In this series, we're looking into free promotion for your ham radio club's not-for-profit fundraiser, specifically the public service announcement, or PSA as they are more commonly called. The first step after obtaining all pertinent information, answering all the who, what, why, where, and when questions, is to write a rough draft of a simple 30-second script, or roughly two short paragraphs. A sample PSA for a ham fest could read something like this. The Bowen County Amateur Radio Club is hosting their third annual ham fest flea market and computer swap meet on Saturday, October 28th at 7 a.m. at the Bowen County Fairgrounds on Fairway Road, two miles east of State Road 9 in Bowen County. Gates open at 7 a.m. Parking is free. Admission is $5 per person. Senior citizens and children under 18 get in for free. The swap meet closes at 4 p.m. Come join the fun. Buy, sell, or trade your electric stuff too. The public is always welcome to attend. Stop in and find out more about amateur radio, sky worn weather spotting, emergency preparedness, ham radio license testing, and free classes. That's Saturday, October 28th, 7 a.m. at the Bowen County Fairgrounds. See you at the Ham Fest. Well, in this sample PSA, we covered all the basic questions and wrote it to appeal to the non-ham but curious. We repeated the most important information of where and when. When we plan an event like a small ham fest, it is a given that most of the attendees are hams. But the biggest reward we reap is new club members and mostly from new hams. So write your PSA to appeal to the non-ham but curious. In this segment, we covered the basic elements of a proper PSA script. We kept it to two short paragraphs, provided all the information, and repeated the date, time, and location. Next time, we'll cover putting this information into a broadcaster-friendly format and getting it ready for sticking in the mail. This is Greg Stoddard, Kilo Fox, Nine Mike Papa, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. And now, with our final story for this week from Southgate Vibes, here is Steve Richards, Gulf 4 Hotel Papa Echo. As a radio operator, hugging the Earth's surface often helps you to cover a short distance. Sometimes it's even preferable, particularly when you're using one of the lower frequency bands. One such antenna recently covered a short distance in just this manner, but it wasn't even transmitting at the time. Compton Victor Kilo 2 Hotel Romeo X-Ray was operating portable way out in the Australian bush one weekend last month and went to bed happy with the performance of his Lynx dipole on 20, 40 and 80 metres. But as he told fellow hams on the Oz Sota mailing list recently, things didn't quite work out the way he'd hoped. He said that when he went to use the antenna on the regular Sunday AM net, nothing could be heard. He discovered that one leg of the aerial was broken at the 4080 link, and the other leg had, well, simply vanished. Walking further on, Compton spotted the bright yellow antenna wire up on a nearby hill. It was then that he remembered the previous night, when a mob of twenty or so kangaroos had come bouncing by. He guessed that one of them may have run off with his wire. The Wireless Institute of Australia said that it was an unusual way to work, wait for it, 
skip, and Compton's antenna had certainly gone the distance. Electron Benders Amateur Radio Club in Tulsa, Oklahoma, airs this week in amateur radio, every week on Club Own KOKTLP 90.9. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Audio News Service, and the ARRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service. AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and all our news team around the world, this is Will Rogers, K5WL.